Hello. Hi, Hi, Catherine. How are you doing? I am good. I was just enjoying the music. I love that little video at the start. <laughs> Jeez. But I, I, I managed to not start whistling because no one wants to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things like I, I can't, every time I do it, I'll always dance a little bit and I always, every single time I try to do the whistle, I'm just not good enough at a whistle to actually get it correct, but it's nice little fun tune. It is, it's nice. I did notice though that f you, I, I get this thing that I think that the number of these that I've done, I should just have every all, everything set to clockwork and just be like on autopilot. And I'm not sure if it was noticed or it, it happened, but I started the stream before I played the intro music. So there might've been a couple of seconds there when it was just like us sitting there before the music started. So I have to That's go fine. back and see that it actually happened. <laughs> We're just sitting there and go like, okay, okay, deep breath. Don't be waiting, nervous, waiting, Catherine, waiting. don't be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you like before we get started do you want to like introduce yourself and then we can then we can get going basically I absolutely can yeah um Fantastic. thank you for having me I'm uh Catherine Wilhelmsen or uh Katrine Wilhelmsen if you want to try the Norwegian <laughs> version you can do the German Always. one it, it sounds pretty much spot on Wilhelmsen yeah you know <laughs> perfect yes um so I work with uh business intelligence data and analytics uh I have been for over 14 years now um, exclusively on the Microsoft and Azure platform. Um, cool. I just kind of fell into it by accident and then I ended up loving it. So I've been here ever since. Nice. Um, I currently work as a solutions architect in a Norwegian company called Evidi um, as a consultant there. Um, and on my free time, I do things that I do at work. So I love yeah. uh, speaking, blogging, um, going to events, get to travel a bit, talk to people. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I've been doing that since 2014, um, and I've been P since 2015. I saw that just before. You've got like you're like nine time MVP or something, right? Yes, I am. That's so I, I, I just impressive. I'm going all in this year because I need that 10 year disc, and then I can like retire and then off everything to uh, the other Norwegian. I like it. Quit when you're at the top, right? Very cool. Yeah. This is um oh, actually, you know, I'm gonna come in straight with a question from 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 Megan. Megan asks very strong questions. She's much better at this than I am, by the way. Um Megan says, when you were when were you when you were a young child, what did you think you would do for a job when you grew up? I like it. It's a nice question. Well, when I was very young, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um until I realized that it's not just, you know, cuddling my soul pets, it's actually dealing with a lot of things that are uh, not so fun. Um, but I actually got into computers and geeky stuff early. I think I was mm. nine or 10, started uh, developing web. Wow, that's uh, cool. So from that age, I, I kind of always knew I wanted to go into IT. Um, not mm. sure what, but I knew I wanted to work with computers. Mm. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Is that something that you also would like you you did at school as well, or was it just all in your in your free time kind of nerding out? It was at all in my free computers? time. Yeah, I mm. think I think in school, um, in my probably second or third grade, I think we had like um, here's a how to open a browser. It was next or here's how to send an email and to go through that. Um, yeah. and it was I mean it, it was fine, but we got our home computer around the same time. I think. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's just when I was like, oh, this is fun. So I think mm. in second grade or between second and third grade, um, our teacher gave us an assignment where we had to, during summer, like write a little journal in a small book and, you know, draw and write a few sentences mm -hmm. like, what did you do this summer? Uh, and I handed it back. And on one of the pages, like, I learned how to type the alphabet on the computer as fast as I could. Uh, so nice. that was me in second or third grade or whatever. So yes, full-time geek my entire life. That's really nice. I like it. So does that mean also you can type well now as well? Have you kept up that ability to, to type well? I think so. Um, but I never learned like touch, so I don't type yeah. properly. I, I basically mm. type with two fingers still, but it's, it's fast. I mean, I, at <laughs> least I hear people going like typing, typing, yeah. typing. So yeah. So but I still, I, ki I kind of look at the the um, keyboard, um, but oh, it's, okay. yeah, it's fast. It's all about, when I say you can type well, I mean like there's a deg degree of accuracy there because I mean, my thing is just hitting the wrong keys and I think it's very annoying. That, 
what happens is I'm really good at pressing backspace. So (laughs) we can fix it fast as well. That's good. (laughs) Yeah, but I'm worse on a phone um, just because I'm so used Mm. to typing on a computer. Like I feel like I'm 90 years old, just like typing on my phone with, with one finger. That's, that's kind of my, give me a keyboard and I'm happy. This is a solid point from Megan, by the way. You make us all feel old when you said the access to the web browser in second grade. This is just oh. very true. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. But I am now getting, you know, I'm having conversations with my coworkers who are 10 years younger than me. Uh, and I, I, I feel the same way. Um, yeah. I had, I went to like, it was um, a computer and beer or programming and pills. Uh, in okay. Norwegian, uh, kind of cool. event a few years back. And I sat there chatting with a guy, nice guy, a little introverted. But, you know, we're mm. just like into web design and web development. And I was like, mm. so how long have you been doing this? Um, and he was like, oh, I've been doing it for, you know, a, a few years. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's like, how long have you been doing it? And I was like, mm. Mm. counting. It was like, oh, okay, 20 something years. And he was like, mm. oh, that's longer than I've lived. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, oh, what he was like, mean. I'm like, okay, yes. Mm-hmm. I am an old person yeah. now, officially. But yes. I'm young at heart. We're I mean, all young at heart. We're fine. It's, you kind of, it's just this, this, this degree when you kind of like, you sit next to someone who's younger than you and they sit next to someone who's younger than them. Everyone just can, if in the right circumstances or the wrong circumstances, maybe I'll put it that way, we can all feel old, right? But um, yeah. yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah. And it's and funny when go. I hear like the people that I think are still young complain about how they're starting to feel old. And I'm like, this is how everyone felt it when I said, and they're still feeling, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I recently turned 41, so like I'm probably in my 40s now. And um, yeah, I think it's quite, it's quite funny when I speak to some of my colleagues and they're like whatever in their early or late 20s, early 30s, and I'm, I'm like the old one because you never feel your age, right? I mean, I don't think you do. I'm, I'm, I, I certainly don't feel 41 just yet, um, but it's, um, it's fun. I wanted to say, by the way, you mentioned before about... Um, where you learned to um, learning your to, to code all this stuff um, in your own time and not do much in school. I found that quite interesting because when I was in school, um, obviously a lot longer ago, we I I had this I always felt completely unsupported at school doing it. Like when I and for my A levels, I wanted to do I think it was just called I forget what it was called like, like computer studies or something, and um, I started it. I did it for about a month maybe two months and it was all like very very basic stuff like just very boring and i just i think after maybe a month and a half i actually dropped it and i switched to instead from computer studies to to theater so i studied theater instead of computers because everything that i was doing at home on my own was so much more interesting to me you know and it's a shame. I'm, sure, I'm sure it's better now but i always just found it a shame that it was just something that you didn't really learn so much about in school you know one second. Yeah, also. Uh, is Norwegian yes, second grade sure. the same as... I couldn't, actually. I was I, I was trying to I'm vamp trying to a little bit there. All good. Um, is Norwegian second grade the same as US second grade? I never hear non you. I find it really difficult to understand this, to be honest. Like, what... How about now? Uh, you can hear you now for sure. Yeah. I'm going to put you back there. Okay. Now. Cool. Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's. I think it's my network. Uh, I'm not it, sure. It happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. Um, um. But yes, I'm not sure if you could hear any of that. Um. But I can. I can relate to the whole part of like feeling like you learn more at home when you're doing the things mm. that you want to do rather than the things mm. that you're being taught. Uh, yeah. I think I had that um, during. Uh, it's well, when I was around 15, 16, I suppose, um, in school. Mm-hmm. So I usually say it's the equivalent of high school, but Megan asked the question, like, is it the same as in the U S mm. approximately let's, let's just go with that. Uh, we have like <laughs> in what, one to 10 and well, basic education. And then we have three mm-hmm. years of next full education. And then we start mm-hmm. university or whatever. 
Um, so anyway, okay. during those yeah. three years, you can decide in which direction you want to go and you can choose to, to kind of specialize um, in different areas. So mm -hmm. I chose uh, media and communication because I wanted to do something in IT. I, I loved, you know, playing with uh, uh, Photoshop and doing all kind of mm -hmm. web stuff. Um, and I think it was my first year there that we uh, had a one-on-one -on -one class in how to build websites. Uh, and I was like, cool. I've done this nice. for like six, seven years already. I think I can, I think I can manage this class. <laughs> um, and the first thing our teacher tells us is like, uh, so we need to make sure that all of our websites are web safe. So you need to stick to the 256 colors and the safe color play. You need to have um, files that are no longer than eight characters in length because of this and that. And I was like, mm. yeah, that that we, we did that years ago. You don't have to do that anymore. And he was like, no, no, but we just do it. I was like, okay, build a pretty website in 256 colors. It's, yeah, it's not as fun. Um, oh, that's but interesting. Yeah, but the HTML part of it was, that was fine. Kind of nailed yeah. that. Um, yeah. And I remember when I got my grade back, um, I loved that class. I had so much fun. Um, when I got my grade back, so uh, six was the highest grade that we could get. And the mm -hmm. teacher was like, I wish I could have given you a seven because you basically taught the entire class for me and you know more than me, but I'll give you a six. <laughs> so I was like, yes. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, Very so I'm like, I'm like Hermione in school, like, ooh. <laughs> um but yeah that was fun i love it wow very cool so basically the, the teacher got like a, a year off just letting you teach the class and kind of... uh, well it was it was like a month or something where we did yeah, that okay. yeah we had different different topics as well that i knew nothing about like we had to go into like animation and stuff i was like i am so lost at this but um it was still fun but i i think oh. um like you said as well like I think it's easier to learn things at home because you're purely driven by interest and you're only doing the mm. things that you want to do and you can dig into you exactly what you're interested in at that time mm. um, as opposed to someone telling you this is this week you're going to learn about this thing mm. and yeah yeah for sure oh look there you go clearly it's true Aww. she, she is a you, superstar Marcia. it's true it's true we know it we know it <laughs> Um, and so your, your, sorry, what, what did you say your actual um, job title is now? What is it that you, that you do? Solutions architect and Solutions. data and analytics. Yes. I like it. Solutions architect always sounds like a really cool job title. I've got to say. Yes. Solutions architect. You just Solutions like, you just architect. get stuff done basically. Yeah. I, I draw boxes and arrows and I tell people that this is what we're going to build and this is how things are going to work. Um, and then I also make sure that I stay hands on because mm. A, I love it. I think it's fun building things and making sure. things work. Um, and also, I, f I feel like I would be a complete fraud if I were to tell other people you need to do this and that if I didn't actually know how to do it yeah. myself. Completely. Yeah, it's yeah. it's the, the primary reason I started. Uh, I, I tried to get more like technical knowledge myself. I didn't want to get to any sort of level where I could be telling or requesting people do things and have no idea what those things meant myself. It's I think we've all been in this situation before, maybe not all, but many people have been in a situation where you have a, a boss or someone who you, who's leading a project or whatever and has really no idea about any of the tools that you're working with. And it's quite frustrating sometimes. So that's yeah. it's quite a it's quite a helpful or I would say necessary thing to have for sure. Nice. Yeah. So Kurt is asking a question. Kurt says, when speaking at conferences, which no, sorry, speaking about which topics give you the most energy? Are they the same topics you get energy from blogging about? Uh, yes. And also, maybe. Uh, I can explain. <laughs> so the first <laughs> thing is uh, on the technical side, like I found my little niche a few years ago with uh, data integration. So I started okay. with SSIS and uh, BIML, for those of you who were into that side of things. Um, and then that gradually moved on to Azure Data Factory and Synapse Analytics, and then now Fabric, of course. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've, I've kind of, I found my little area, and then I just kept going within that area. Um, and that gives me a lot of energy, because it's something that I do. It's something mm -hmm. that um, 
I keep running, like, I feel like I'm smacking my head into walls sometimes trying to learn all this new technology and like things are not working the way they are supposed to. And then I figure it out or I solve something and then I get like mm. super excited just to share that with others. Like, here mm. is how you can do things without tearing your hair out the way that I have. Yeah. Uh, so I think yeah. that gives me a lot of energy. Um, and also just seeing the people in the room uh, go like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I can use this in this way, or, you know, this is going to uh, help me in my job, um, especially mm. if people actually say that to me, it feels really good. So um, helping others is a selfish thing. It's just how it works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also enjoy um, talking about things like presentation skills uh, in Norway on PowerPoint, okay. how to use that. So. I have a few other topics as well that I can be super excited about, um, but that I maybe I don't blog as much about them or it's um, it's kind of a meta session where I mm. talk about how sessions or how I build sessions, um, but that could be really fun as well. Wow, that's really cool. It's nice that they, it's it's broad what you what you present about talk about or, or enjoy. And I guess that itself keeps it interesting as well. If it's just like one or two subjects, perhaps you could you could start feeling I don't know, perhaps repetitive, maybe, but when you can really enjoy so many different topics, nice. Yeah, I, I think it, it could be both. Uh, sometimes it's nice to just be able to repeat a session in different locations so you don't True. have to spend like hundreds mm. of hours building out new stuff all the time. Um, mm. But then it's also nice to be working in an area where I can always kind of expand on something else or sure. um, do that intersection where you, this is my area, but then I'm talking a little bit about this because it touches on the same thing or, yeah. yeah. I feel like in, in the Microsoft world, there is always something new I can talk about. Very true. Very true. But because it is, because it is your, 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 your interest in or what you present or what you talk about is so broad, how, how do you like keep that focused? Like, there is, as you said yourself, there is, even if you pick a topic, like one topic, on that topic, there's so much to learn about, so much to, to read about. How then do you keep yourself focused on that? Because I, I could not do that, to be honest. I think that might just be how I work or how yeah. my brain works. Like I, I can hyper focus on one thing, no problem. Okay. No problem okay. at all. But I also think that um, the thing that I enjoy the most is everything for beginners, introductory sessions or mm -hmm. like I'm doing now, a beginner's guide. Um, I just really nice. enjoy being able to help others get started faster. Um, mm. And I feel, I think, and I hope <laughs> that I'm pretty good at explaining things in a simple way that makes it easy for people to understand, even if they yeah. don't have a data background or they haven't done anything mm. um, in the past. Um, and I, I quite enjoy the whole process of taking something that is complex and maybe even just very abstract um, and simplifying it and visualizing it, uh, maybe like draw mm. a picture or put it into some, I don't know, a format that that people can actually see and hear and read about at the same time. Yeah. Um, and because I enjoy that process, yeah. I, I feel like it's probably easier for me to just focus on that. So I take something that I know and I feel comfortable with and I basically teach the old version of myself. Like, this is how I would do it if I knew the thing I know now. That's nice. Yeah. I like that. I think, I mean, Kurt said the, the valuable sessions. I completely agree. And what I really um, appreciate about that is I, so someone for myself who came from a very non-technical background when I started working with, with, with um, Power BI, I, um, and I think it's still, is, it's true now as well that because you have more and more people coming into this um, industry from a non-technical background, I think what I find is missing quite often are, is documentation or information aimed at people like myself back then who, and it's spoken in non-technical terms. It's really hard to find documentation where you don't have to Google like every fifth word. Yeah. You know? Um, and I think that's, that's a big miss, and I think it's maybe doesn't really reflect where we are now. Not everyone, of course, but a lot of us in the in industry, you know? Yeah, and um, I, I feel like I run into those things when I try to move outside of my little bubble of mm. doing data stuff. Um, like, uh, was it like two years ago, I think? I 
uh, started to rebuild my entire website. Again, for fun, it was a fun project. Um, so I had to learn everything uh, on uh, uh, Hugo, which is built on Go. So I had to dig into like, okay, how do I do this from scratch? Um, and I ran into so many things like just how do I start this project? Like what do I need to install on my computer to start yeah. building a Go website? How does this work? Hmm. Um, and very often we we tend to jump into things because we assume that everyone knows the basics like we do. Yeah. Um, so that was, I think, every time I run into those things, it, it kind of reminds me that, you know, if you're presenting something for people and it is an intro session, just make sure to explain the basics, even if you feel like everyone knows it. Yeah. Um, you're probably going to have someone in the audience who are like, oh, oh, I haven't actually seen that part before, or I didn't know about this keyboard shortcut or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And also I need to, uh, I need a big shout out to my mom uh, because she nice. has been the person who has listened to all of my sessions. She doesn't know anything about it. Uh, she is not technical whatsoever. She has no interest in technical stuff, uh, but she likes me, which is a good thing. Um, so I, I try to explain things to her. And if I can explain topics and technical things and the things that I do for work to my mom in a way that she can understand, I'm likely to be able to explain it to other people. So it's also about like relating it to what you already know. So for my mom, it's, you know, relate data warehousing to an actual house, plumbing and electricity and whatnot, mm. or something in the kitchen, like the process of making a cake and, and kind of, I don't know, just, just find these little stories that you can explain concepts in a way that um, people go like, oh, okay, yeah. I mm. know it's not exactly the same, but I can I can kind of see how this works together. Yeah. So wow, yeah. that's cool. My mom is really nice having <laughs> to listen to me for hours and hours talk about things she knows nothing about. I'm she sure it's a joy. Like, You're really enthusiastic about this, and I'm proud of you. So I'm like, thank Aww. you, mom. <laughs> that's so sweet. I love that. Yeah. Very cool. And I love the fact that you took the time out to give the shout out to your mom as well. That's fantastic. Yes. She might she might see it later at some point, and then she's going to be like, oh, I saw you said that. No, it's kind of <laughs> well, we could put that little part on a, on a YouTube short so you don't have to watch the entire thing, okay? You can just send her the clip for the show. <laughs> right, there you go. Yeah, perfect. Oh, man. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I, explaining things and, and understanding new concepts and products or what have you, I mean, it kind of kind of reminds me of when I first started playing around with fabric and I had like this zero idea what was going on. Um, I had a call with, because there was something I couldn't get to work. And my issue with, with, with fabric, I mean, I haven't really dug into it for about a couple of months now. So I'm sure it's all completely different or whatever. But my issue with it, because I didn't have that technical background or it was kind of out of my area with, you know, engineering science type stuff. Um, I wasn't sure if, if it was me getting it wrong or is fabric being preview features. So just being errors it's there, bits and pieces. Always fabric. It's never <laughs> the user. It's always Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I did a presentation the other day, and one of the sections was called "Microsoft Lied to Us All." Um, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. nice. Um, but yeah, I, so I had a call with, with Charles Webb. Called me, which was really cool of him, and just to go through some stuff. And I felt I was I felt really self conscious because, like Charles, you understand that. Because you recorded it as well, you said so. I can, so I can take this feedback and show it to people. And I was like, "Oh, Jesus Christ!" Oh no! Um, yeah, but it was it was basically a video of me just not understanding what I was supposed to do to go through. Because there was a part way where you created something using like the wizard, but if you had to edit it, there was no wizard. And I was like, "This is all just quite overwhelming for for a human like me." Yeah. Um, so it's, it's it's tough when there's something you can. I mean, generally speaking, Fabric did overwhelm me, and I'll I'll dive back into it when when I have time. But yeah, yeah but I, I feel like that's the most important job that Microsoft has as well, and especially with Fabric, considering they're aiming it towards citizen developers and yeah. and people who are not from a technical background. They need to make sure that it is intuitive and it is easy to use. Um, and I also understand that they might not get it right the first time um, because everything yeah. is super technical, you know, mm. underneath the hood. But yeah. I've, I've done some of those um, even just like UX tests that I've been mm. part of. And they're like, explain to us what you think would happen if you click here. And I'm like, oh, my God, am I going to say the wrong thing? Mm. Like, am I going to sound really dumb? And I mean, that's why they're asking for that feedback mm. so they can yeah. kind of explain 
this is the thought process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this is actually about hitting a, an overwhelming spot in tech is um, in a tech process like that is generally UX failure. It's yeah. fair point. I mean, this, for all I've worked with Power BI for many years, and it's once you start working with a product for a long time, you, you kind of start being sometimes it's easy to be negative about it because you're so used to all the good things that you kind of focus on the, on the bad things. I do maintain that though Power BI isn't, well, it can be, but it's, I always found the, 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 the UX actually very good from, from Power BI. It was very simple to pick up. You go here, you click on these things and all that type of stuff. So I found that was a, quite a big win. Um, but obviously the entire, as you said yourself, the, the, the entire fabric infrastructure, what it contains is a lot more techy, it's a lot more detailed. So to make that user-friendly for a citizen developer, citizen engineer, this tough. It is, it is. And yeah. it's merging to very separate worlds in some way with uh, business users or citizen developers, with those of us who are coming from that very technical background, who have been the back end engineers or developers for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then they have to balance, okay, so these are the things that uh, business people talk about and are requesting and what they want. And then you have the technical people coming in going like, this is not technical enough. I can't mm. do all the techie stuff that I can in this other product, which is um, mm. just a different side of it, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I can only kind of just repeat what Megan said. If, if a user feels overwhelmed or are confused about something, it is a UX thing. Um, the best thing is where you feel like, you know, that everything just works, but it's, it's mm. difficult to get to that. It is, it is. And I'm sure we'll look at that bit, bit by bit, but yeah, um, also Jesper saying that uh, there's a long way to go for an Excel user to use and understand for, yeah, I mean, sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like that might be the next thing I'm super excited about because um, as of right now, this, this past like half year since uh, Fabric was released, I've been in the little bubble where I've been um, doing projects, I've been working hands-on with it, trying to learn it myself and get to the point where I feel comfortable enough to teach mm. it to others. Yeah. Um, and I think that trying to create something where I can introduce people who are not from the data engineering or um, kind of like the old ETL world to how to use pipelines, how to get pull data in, how to use data flows, how to set up something that works for you. Um, I feel like that would be a, a cool challenge to do at some point. I just need uh, all the days to be 48 hours so I can I can find the time to do all the things I want to do. We can try our best to, to arrange that for you, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, let's let's say 50 hours so you can get some sleep as well, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah good idea. Deal? Yes, deal. Love it. So since we're on the subject of, of Fabric, um, can you explain this? Snacks spelled in a way that I can't provide and I provide, pronounce. <laughs> it's just snacks. Snacks. Yeah. Okay. Hashtag snacks. Yeah. I like it. So the the weird letter is just a and snacks. Okay. So Very cool. Snacks. Yeah. There you go. It so it turns out that I can't pronounce it. Fantastic. <laughs> Everyone can. Sign. Yes. See, you've just you've already taught me something. There you go. Yes, it's it's a very Norwegian way of saying snacks, um, and and the story behind that is there is a, a video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It was published recently um, on the Pass Summit channel, where Marta, Emilia, and I we um, uh, recorded a video of what are we excited about going to Pass Summit this year. So you need to find that one. It's it's brilliant. Um, and I, uh, I took on the task of just like editing it and making sure that it was uh, sound was fine and, and send it over to um, the past HQ people. Uh, and then I realized that in every clip, uh, Amelia kept saying that she was so excited about the people and the snacks and the snacks and the people and the snacks. Um, so it kind of I, I, I did it without her permission, but I think I think she's fine with it now. But I just made this blooper reel of all of us and I cut that together. So it's just like, yeah, snack, snack, snacks. Um, and it. it is something that we are all in the Fabric February group. We're all very, very excited about that. Uh, so we have a goal of having uh, an event in February mm -hmm. uh, about Fabric and snacks is a very important. Yes. 
Yes. I remember Martha mentioned this as well, and I'm yes. very excited about the snacks. And the more you mention the snacks, the more excited I am about the prospect of those snacks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really want to come to that. It'd be really cool. Yes, it'll be, it'll be... you have to come. Yeah, and it's not so far away. I've got no excuses. Actually, it turns out that my plans next year are getting more and more um, northern related, I want to say, or northern yes. oriented. I'm not sure. Are you going because... to Faroe, you know? The Faroe Islands? Ah, I, I hope so. Yes. Can, can you say I it again, please? Because it. it sounds cooler when you say uh, it. I, I say Faroe, you know? Oh, okay. I, I only Love said it. it in Norwegian so that I would give myself time to remember what it's called in English. So, <laughs> but then it sounds fun as well. But it's a thing it I do. Fun. I just go like, I can't remember the word. Just say it in Norwegian and people are going to be like, can you say that again? And then I have time to. So That's a clever tactic. A, a tip for everyone. I like that a lot. All I've got to do yeah. now first is learn Norwegian and then I can use that <laughs> tactic, you know? <laughs> Snacks! There yes. it is. Awesome. See? Yes. The goal should be between now and fabric, um, February to, to put that into as many live streams as possible. Yes. That has to be some kind of target. We have, I think, at least three. Now. Yeah, I think you did. So you did one with, with, there was one with Chris Wagner, which, which I saw was yep. it yesterday. Yep. Was it Reed Havens as well? I can't remember. I'm not sure. So I know, I've seen two of the live streams that uh, Marta has done <laughs> with you and Chris Wagner. I'm not sure if it's up, but yes, we will we will make sure to spread the word. Hashtag snacks. <laughs> Hashtag snacks, fantastic, yes. cool. So yeah, that's amazing, by the way. I mean, I've, I've said before, planning an event is looks like an extraordinary amount of work. So yeah. Not it is. Well. So it's a good thing that we have a very nice group of women working together to get things done. I saw that. You've got I was, I was on I'll, I'll post the website on the um on the on the stream there if i can find it somewhere Thank i you. found it and uh, yeah it is a cool it is a cool group so i'm yeah. sure you'll do an amazing job and i'm sure everyone will love it and like i say hopefully me too loving it i've never been to norway always want to go i just like places that are potentially cold basically well I, I, that fits perfectly yeah people yeah. always think i'm strange that i like cold wind and rain and snow these are my favorite things this is the best weather. are you sure you're not norwegian no actually norwegians don't like any of that as the people who don't live in it all the time they enjoy it exactly exactly <laughs> i'm from i'm from northeast england so we we have wind and we have rain but not so much snow you know it's the actually i you know i was speaking to kurt the other day um and kurt mentioned that he said exactly the same thing i said i think he showed me a picture of someone snow somewhere i was like oh, i want to see that he was like you don't you don't want to live in that snow. You got to shovel it all the time, man. It's really annoying. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, I feel like I want snow in the week between Christmas and New Year. Yeah. And then the rest of the year, I can go to the snow when yeah. I want the snow. I don't want the snow to come to me. So if it can just stop coming to me and just like stay out in the woods, mm. that would be nice. Who is it that I did it? That's, and I, you made me think of someone. I did a live stream with someone um, a couple of months ago and he has like a, cabin up out in the snow and he's got these two dogs that he was and it's it looked amazing he's always like has post photographs on on, on twitter of that's these, like, uh johan ludwig brattos right sequel, thank you sequel class right yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly but yeah no it would be great i watched the um i forget what it was and i forget which country it was set in so i do apologize for displaying my huge ignorance here there was like a a, a show on netflix about someone at christmas time and I think it's the thing about the, the 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 concept of the show was like she was looking for someone to bring home for Christmas on a date or something. That's a Norwegian. Uh, is it show. Norwegian? Yes. Okay. I think it's called Home for Christmas. Right. It is. That's what it's called. Yeah. Fantastic. And there's one scene or the few scenes where she's like literally going down the front street like on this like sled thing. Yep. Oh my god. Dream. Yes, that's exactly how we do it in Norway in all the <laughs> cities all the time yeah. all winter. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're all just going around on sledges, kind of like that. The thing about Australians going to work on a kangaroo, right? It's just yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Some people do, um, mm. but it's it's not so much in Oslo. Although uh, sometimes, if we get like a lot of snow during night, you will see people ski to work downtown Oslo. It's very yeah. fun. Yeah, that's cool. I like that yeah. a lot. You have you see some people, and I think it's more of like a social media thing. People in, in Berlin who go to work on like canoes and stuff, kind of like going down the rivers and what have you. Um, that's I mean, I work from home, so <laughs> that's 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 not me. 
that's more me from going from from my bedroom into my kitchen to get some coffee and then up to my office and that, that that's my commute you know so do you have any stairs or is it all on one level no we have we have three 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 floors so bedroom okay. down to the kitchen then all the way all two flights of stairs all the way back up to my to my office so wow. technically you could just use a sled and go downstairs and I could. like we could my kids would love that as well yeah i mean there then there then, is a risk involved but risk is fun so and but when i had the risk that's fine i'll just install one of those standard chairlift things and it'll take me all the way back up to the top <laughs> yes i would love that fantastic yeah Oh man, um, I, I made a note of something before. I want to ask a question now because it sounded really interesting. I'd never heard of it before, but the Fizz Buzz Challenge. Yes. What is this? this is so really... that is a very, I think it's from the programming world. Mm. I have no idea when it started, but it is a very common like a uh, programming test or a test that you get and interviews uh, showing that you know how to apply logic and how you, you have to solve it in a specific way. It's called, what is it called? Um, um, someone can correct me in chat. Mo modulo mod. It's mod, like the, okay. the mod function where you find the remainder of uh, a number and then you have to do uh, like logic around that. Okay. So it's, it's a very simple challenge on paper. It's, it doesn't require a lot of code and you can do it in a million different ways and different languages, um, programming languages. Um, so I think it's it's something that um, most people who are new in programming might stumble onto at some point. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's usually in programming languages like, I don't know, um, C Sharp or Java or something like that, where, where okay. you would run into it. But hmm. I was like, I'm sure we can do this in, in SQL as well. Um, some of my coworkers did it in uh, PowerShell and Python. Um, mm. and I was like, I, I can do this in SQL. So I just, cool. no real point to it other than I just could do it. Challenge. I found yeah. one way. I'm sure you can do it in 10 other ways. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just, it was a fun thing. And I think um, it was a fun thing as well because I did it with my coworkers and we all yeah. found our own way of doing things yeah. uh, and just kind of um, I looked at what they did in Python and in PowerShell. And I was like, "Oh, that's really clever!" And mm. um, yeah, I like that. It's a cool idea. Also, I like just as you were talking there towards end, that that concept of actually having challenges for the sake of challenges to do with um, to do them with your coworkers as well. Yeah, that's a really cool. I've never actually, to be honest, never engaged in anything like that before, and it sounds really fun. I think my my department is really good at that. Um, we have a massive teams chat. Um, I think we're mm. pretty close to 30 people now, I think, um, mm. in, in my department. So we have a big teams chat and it's, you know, some work stuff, some uh, personal stuff, some just like fun stuff. Um, but then every year for Christmas, we do this Christmas calendar or advent calendar, mm. whatever you want to call it. Um, it's on a Norwegian uh, website. It's actually a newspaper for coders or programmers in mm -hmm. Norway. And they have this um, Christmas calendar every year with like a new task that you have to solve every day. Mm. Um, and you can sign up, you can sign up to be a part of a team as well. Um, and we won it, is it three years in a row now? I think because we have all of us super excited. We solve everything every day. Mm. Uh, and then you you know, you accumulate points and the team with the most amount of points win. And because mm. we're so many people, uh, we've won that. And we've even had people who aren't working in tech. We've had people working on um, like uh, change management and, and mm. skills and licensing. They were like, oh, this looks interesting. Let me see if I can, you know, learn something and do something in Python or whatever. Cool. Um, which is, it's, it's just fun. Um, and we're very strict on never giving the solution to anyone else because we're not going to learn anything from that. So mm. we occasionally, we give some hints, we can nudge people in the right direction. We can, you know, if they're completely stuck on something, just kind of here's how to get started. Um, mm. And then they figure it out. And then once uh, we go to the next day, we can share like the previous day's solution. And then go like, oh, that was, that was Martin. Nice idea. I might, yeah. I might, steal that a little bit and see if I can do some with it. Cause I think it would be, be quite cool. Yeah. I, 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 I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. I'm going to mute myself for a second here. 
sorry, I'm recovering, I'm recovering from a mild cold, so I'm hitting that mute button pretty hard today. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned quite often that the working with Power BI, when you're working primarily Power BI, it's not a particularly collaborative process, you know? You can find yourself working from the entire process of all the ETL stuff until the report's published and finished and you've done it all on your own. So I think it makes you think more and more in a solitary way, you know? Yes, you, you reach out and you always make sure that people are fine with asking questions and that's what, and you know the standard you know it's fine to ask any question don't be embarrassed all that kind of stuff but to work with someone else on a solution at the same time doesn't really happen very often to be honest and i think yeah. it's a shame because it yeah. makes you work in a, yeah. i feel like that is probably the thing that i enjoy most these days mm. um because i have been working alone on I think probably maybe the last three or four years I've been, I've been working with people, but I haven't had a team that I work closely with on the same yeah. project. Um, yeah. And I finally got that um, this summer and having a coworker to work closely with on one project, being there for a couple of other coworkers and helping them with their projects. Um, just today, uh, they came there like, Hey, Catherine, we're doing slowly changing dimensions. Can, can you just do a Q and a on our logic and is our thought process, are, are we right in doing it this way? Mm -hmm. Um, and just having those conversations, I think, um, I always thought that I enjoyed working alone because no one's going to interrupt me and no one's going to bother me and this and that. Mm. I don't really like people. Uh, that's why I work with computers. Uh, <laughs> but then I realized that, okay, I, I like some people. Yeah. Some, some people are, are actually kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and fortunately, I get to work with a lot of the cool people right now. Nice. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just having those conversations and working on things and seeing different perspectives, um, mm. different yeah. ways of solving things as well, I think it's super important. Absolutely, for sure. I um, I, I worked in my previous company. I worked with with someone, and what we did quite often, we'd have an issue or something that we couldn't solve. We just we just call each other like spontaneously and talk about it. And quite often, we found actually the other person wasn't providing the answer, but by having the conversation, we found the answer on our own because we're thinking about it and explaining it to someone else, and just appeared. Um, I mentioned this to my my current boss, and he said something. I was like, what? And he was like, oh, rubber duck coding. You said, yep. you just, I'd never heard this before, rubber duck. <laughs> Again, it's, it's a thing that uh, those of us who have been working for a few years, we're like, oh, you're just rubber ducking in people. I did what yeah. now? Was, was that an insult or should, what is, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's funny that it got to the point where you have an entire, like, this is the name of this thing that you're doing, which is basically just explaining things out loud. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that is, um, that's also a key thing for, for people who want to get into, um, I don't know, whether it's like speaking or blogging or doing mm. videos, or even if you don't want to do any of those things, just having a, a blog uh, to explain things in a way that you are explaining it to someone else, whether that someone else exists or not, it's super important. It's, it's yeah. a really good way of, um, figuring out, you know, what, uh, what is causing this issue or where mm. am I stuck? And yeah. Yeah. I, I realized that, I mean, I used to hate public speaking. I used to hate presenting and stuff. And, um, one of a boss that I had a long time ago, she said to me, I promise at some point you'll love it. Okay. And I did not believe her at all. I was like, no, I'm, I'm the person who goes like pink, like the color behind me when I'm talking. Right. Um, but she was right. Fine like, now. Yeah, I mean, every now and then I, I start to get at that point where I feel my face getting getting more and more pink when it's like, like an internal like heating system, you know? But it doesn't bother me anymore. It's just the way it is, right? Um, it's only my face. <laughs> but I realized it was because the more, the more I did it, the more I knew about the subject, the more I knew about the subject, the more comfortable I got actually talking about it because it was just if I didn't I didn't like it because I just I don't, didn't feel informed enough but now if I if I know the subject and I'm confident with it I can talk about it all day you're like shut up Ben it's enough now um so yeah it's it's nice yeah and I think uh looping back to what you asked earlier as well um you know how can you stick to one thing mm -hmm. I think that is also a key part of it if you stick to the one thing that you have experience with you have worked hands-on or you've done it multiple times, you feel comfortable enough to, to explain that to other 
people and you feel comfortable getting those questions. Mm. Um, and mm. I, I think most people who get into speaking in the beginning, they're terrified of like, what if I can't answer this question? Or what if I don't know this thing? Or what if I say something wrong? Um, and, and I get it. I've been there myself. But if you talk about your experience and the way that you approached a problem and the way that you found a solution, it might not objectively be the perfect way of doing things, but it's yeah. your story. It's yeah. your way of doing things. Yeah. Um, so that is for, for anyone who gets into speaking, that's, that's what I always recommend. Just, just tell your story and, yeah. and you, like, no one can argue with you on like, your story is wrong. Like, no, I lived that. You can't, you can't, that does not work in this way. Absolutely. Um, but it, it is a, it is a hurdle to, to kind of get mm. up on stage and, and talk to people for sure. Yeah. I have my, my first ever in-person speaking event coming up next month. <gasps> Yay! And, um, yeah. I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, I, I don't feel nervous. I probably will before I start at some point. Um, and I haven't done any in-person events since before um, Corona, you know? So it's, since then it's all been like online, all that kind of, obviously. Um, but in, and even before that, I think it was a maximum of like doing Power BI trainings for I think a maximum of like like 30 people in the room and stuff, you know? Which is an okay number. Um, but I feel that at this point, I probably won't mind as much the fact that it, the people are there in front of me. I, I'll, I'll probably be more scared about the technical stuff, like, you know, something not working. And But on that side as well, I've seen enough of, of those events that I know that it's, to an extent, not even expected that everything goes perfectly, you know? So yeah. I think it's about just, I mean, again, I'm saying I think it's about I have no experience of talking live yet, but I, I, I think that the expectation is just that it goes how it goes. And if you're kind of comfortable and don't get nervous about things going wrong, it should be quite okay. We'll see that. Yeah. And again, if you are talking about something that you are comfortable talking about, you yeah. can always just go, it broke. It doesn't work. Um, it happened to me at my, my last speaking engage, uh, engagement. I was showing something in fabric and then boom, everything dies like globally. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, okay, I, th that wasn't, yeah. it was not my fault. Yep. I mean, I could, you can always say that, but um, it wasn't my fault. And I was like, okay, so what was supposed to happen here is mm. this, this, and this, and you can mm. talk people through it and, you know, it's fine. We, yeah. We've all been there. Um, yeah. So I think you just, you turn it into like much bigger deal in your own head mm -hmm. when you're yeah. on stage than the people in the audience. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. It should be good fun. I got But go I think I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll enjoy the just like uh, having the crowd there, seeing them, and especially if you get some of those nodders in the audience. I love the nodders. So to everyone who's watching now, if you ever go to a session, be a nodder. Be like, look at the speaker and and nod and you know yeah. take notes and just like mm. give them that encouragement because yeah. that energy is so contagious. Yeah. Yeah. I can well imagine. That's, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Be a, be a good audience member. Yes. <laughs> Even like uh, the conference that I went to, I um, it was not a data conference. It was just like a generic tech conference. I had no clue what some of the people were talking about, but I still was like, I will nod enthusiastically because I can see that this is something that you're enthusiastic about. This is mm. this is really cool. It's yeah, it's a form of encouragement, right? It's yeah. just like yep, yeah, keep going. Yep, it's good. It's it's going well. Yeah. I I gave a, a remote presentation um, a few days ago or last week. I forget. It doesn't matter. And I could only see because of the angles and stuff. I was the only one who wasn't in the room. They were all there. I was just remote. And there was I could see two people on the front row. And one person looked totally enthusiastic. And I was so happy because also it was something that I'd never presented about before. It was about performance optimization. And I've never presented about that. But I was like, OK, so hope it goes all right. And the other person who I could see looked the opposite, just extraordinarily uninterested. And I'll say, you know what, Ben, focus on the person who looks interested. Just that, just yeah. only look there on the screen. Yeah. And honestly, I would take, I would take one person being enthusiastic and um, learning something from my session mm. than having, you know, 20 people who like, they just don't care. Like, I don't care about the number, just a few people who learn something is good enough. Yeah. But yeah. Well, what I'm really looking forward to, I mean, I, the, the, the Power BI trainings that I, that I used to give, as much as I love working from home, I really do enjoy it very much. In-person trainings, I love that 
the fact that you can connect with the people and it's so easy to see who's following and who isn't following, who might need a bit more attention, who you, could, you just walk over to. And people tend to be a bit more scared. I mean, scared is the wrong word, hesitant to say something's go or something's wrong on a, um, on a call, you know, it just, there's a different connection, you know? Yeah. And, and I think, um, I think the worst part there is if you deliver a session remotely and you're just talking to a computer screen mm. for an hour and you can't see anyone, you can't yeah. get any feedback. It's like, I'm sitting there, I'm enthusiastic and I tell a joke and I laugh and I'm like, I have no idea if anyone else laughed at that at all. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. very, very awkward. So and yeah, as to, definitely as in person is, is easier because you sure. can always, and even if like, if you feel like you're getting stuck on something or if you feel like you're getting a loss, like someone in the audience, everyone in the audience wants you to succeed because they of want course. to learn something. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And as you said before, be, be the person who nods, I completely agree. I also appreciate the person on a, a on a remote session if there's one person who keeps their camera on, I appreciate that person so much for exactly what you just said. So I can feel like there's, I'm actually having a conversation with someone, not doing yeah. some kind of strange recording. Because when I can see someone, it becomes more personable and I, it makes it more conversational. And when yeah. I give trainings or we really do anything, I like it to be conversational, just to feel natural and rather than seeing, then you go here and then you do that, which is quite monotonous and no one likes that, you know? It is. Yeah, should be good fun though. But yes, as yeah. someone said which, in the chat. Which event is it that you're oh, speaking at? It's um I can't remember, which is really bad. It's in Palmer. It's um data. Oh, it's a sequel Saturday? Saturday? Yeah. Or data, is it a data Saturday? Yeah. Data Saturday in in, okay. in in Palmer. I think also um um Data Mozart is gonna be there as well. So that'd be quite cool. Cool. I'll get I'll get to see him for the yeah. I saw I, I met him once up in um in um Billund um for but i I, met, I think i was there for, the, for a couple of days together but i spoke to him like for like 10 minutes the entire time with all the, the people in the the first conference conference i've ever been to so i was feeling quite overwhelmed and it was all yeah. all that type of stuff you know so now it should, it should be and i get to go to palmer so that's yeah. quite nice to see a different it place and uh, it's the perk of speaking like yes when exactly. we can actually travel a few years it was it was not as fun uh yeah. just sitting at home where i spent all my day every day uh did did yeah. you find did you find that in any way? I mean, of course, it was, it was locked down. It was Corona. It was it was a hard time for everyone. Did you find it in any way helpful to be located at home? Was this, was, was there any benefit? Could you draw a single positive <laughs> out of it? <laughs> I, I could tell you everything I hated about it. Uh, yeah. um, I'm, I'm sure there are some things. I think the most important benefit that came out of it is uh, showing that we can actually be productive working from home yeah, and that uh, it, it cost things like, you know, Microsoft with Teams and other software to you. They just had to make it work. Mm. Uh, so we can actually be more flexible with our work days um, mm. and still get things done. Mm. I feel like that was uh, a larger benefit for me mm. personally. Um, I'm not so sure, to be honest. Mm. Um, but maybe it forced me to reconsider like my hobby had always been speaking and traveling mm. and doing all of that for many, many years before the mm. pandemic hit. Um, and it did kind of force me to look into other hobbies that weren't yeah. related to work. So I guess that is a good thing as well. That's true. The hobbies one is an important one because I was going to ask at the very start and you've reminded me, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you said that, you know, your hobbies are a lot of the things that you do professionally. So drawing that line is extremely difficult sometimes and can be quite, yeah, challenging and overwhelming. How do you manage yeah. that? Do, do you... uh, well, I have burned myself out on a couple of occasions, okay. so I'm okay. not sure. I'm very good at managing it. Okay. Um, Sorry to hear that. Yeah. No, but it is, uh, for sure, it's, it's just like I have to have a routine. I, I need to kind of draw a line between work and free time. Um, snacks. Snacks. Yeah, snacks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, snacks. Um, and yoga pants all day. Okay, that is, that is definitely a benefit. Yes. Is, but yeah. that was also my point. Working from home, I have to have that routine where I get up and put on actual work clothes mm, and okay. go like into the zone of like now I'm in work mode. Mm. Um, but also 
during the pandemic, one of my hobbies was to renovate my new house that I bought during the pandemic. Cool. And I bought a house that I had to renovate because I, well, it, it's nice just tearing down walls and painting and doing physical things that is in front of a screen. Mm. Um, but that also gave me my own office. Um, cool. So I can actually close the door and, and this is my work zone. And then mm. I can go somewhere else when I'm yeah. not in work mode. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think uh, other than that, it's, it's just being aware of um, trying to know, like, okay, this is a healthy way of me for me to enjoy my hobbies and and work on demos and slide decks, mm. uh, as opposed to okay, now I'm I'm getting really tired. I just need to go and do something else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Nice. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, uh, I but then the other hobby I found was League of Legends, which is also in front of my computer, in front of a screen. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I intentionally found something that didn't involve a screen, though it can involve a screen. Uh, it, it doesn't have to, which, which is quite nice, yeah. which also relates to what I was going to um, ask you as well, mention it at the very least. Um, I started to learn how to play the ukulele a little bit. And, um, Very cool. Yeah, which is, is good fun. And the guy who I, the, the classes that I do, the lessons that I do are, are online, hence the screen is there as well, but not all the time. But the guy who, who teaches, he said um, a couple of times, and it all sticks with me, that he said primarily, like first uh, before anything, I'm a teacher who happens to play this instrument, who happens to play musical instruments. And that made a lot of sense to me because I, I realized actually probably only about six months ago. How much when I was younger, and when I say younger, I also mean my twenties. Um, I wanted to be a teacher, you know, and which I didn't do because I moved to Germany and you know language and stuff. But and I maybe I realized that because I enjoy the teaching part of my job so much. I enjoy giving the trainings. I enjoy people contacting me for asking questions and and all that kind of stuff. And maybe there's just something in people's personality that if you enjoy teaching, if you enjoy spreading that knowledge. It kind of makes you, I don't know, go down a certain route or no matter, or maybe no matter what you do, that's always going to be part of who you are, you know? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you, you see it yourself that you, you, how you enjoy kind of like giving the information out and, and showing people and training. Yeah, and... That, that, it's interesting that you say it because um, I'm not sure I've really reflected on that, but I did mm. at some point consider going into actual teaching. Uh, so, I mean, there must have been something there that yeah. I just, I enjoy and I find some way of mm. applying that. Yeah. It's maybe like a way of communicating, just like the way to kind of like, if, if you feel that you like to, to learn and that you know a big part of learning is explaining, then maybe, I have no idea what it is. I'm just guessing and saying random things now. Um, but you sound but really smart to just keep going. One of the things is I'll talk, I, I might I, for the first minute make me sound smart, but I, when you get into the third minute, I just sound like an idiot again. So I've got to shut myself up at some point, you know? <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, but this is, I've got to say, this is, you know, the pandemic was the best thing that happened for my professional career. I can see that could be true for a lot of people, to be honest. I think so. And and I wish like I could just like bring Anthony on the call because I was like, tell me more about this. I, I would mm. like to hear that perspective. Yeah. Um, but I do think that the one thing that I've seen uh, is people who got into doing things like uh, YouTube or uh, mm. blogging or anything that they suddenly found their audience because people could only do things virtually as opposed to going in person. Um, I feel like they could uh, really like blossom during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and also it, it opened up for so many more people who aren't able to travel anywhere. People who have, you know, families or other obligations or they can't afford to travel anywhere. Suddenly they also found their entire audience who mm. are now doing virtual events. So yeah. I think that a lot of good things came out of the pandemic. Yeah. 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 One of the challenges I'm thinking about, right, it just, you mentioned user groups and how it went online and, you know, bigger audiences and stuff. Um, the Berlin user group, which I'm kind of been a part of, like organized it since March or something. We discussed also like doing in-person events as well every now and then just to kind of bring some of that element back, which of course used to happen. The, my thought for, on that is though, that though it would be cool, I actually don't know how many of the Berlin Power BI user group are actually based in Berlin anymore. Yeah. So I'm not sure how to engage that audience, that a much more local audience, you know? It's 
it's something I've never had to consider and I, I wouldn't know how to get the people there. And yeah. I want to, I want to ask some people who run user groups and, and, and ask them how they do it and stuff, but it, it would be cool. But as you said yourself, people who got into this kind of realm during the pandemic, which I very much did, it's strange to think to, of organizing anything in the real world. Yeah. And I think everyone is kind of expecting things to be at least hybrid now. Yeah. Um, mm. we, we had a conversation on that on fabric February as well, mm. where like, we, we want to get people together. We, mm. um, and that's why we also decided to do it on a weekday because we want to show, um, employees, uh, employers yeah. that it is important to, you know, stay up to date, to get the latest updates, to go and have those days where you can just focus on learning new things. Mm. Um, and we want them to, to be like, yeah, this is actual this is not something that um, our employees are uh, supposed to do on their free time. So let's do it during the week. Um, and then I think for us, just we need to reach out to all the companies and try to promote it in that way. Um, That's fantastic. So, so that could be like an idea. Just yeah. if you, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's difficult. Um, yeah. And I think I, I feel like people have been, uh, they have also in some way become more protective of their free time. So mm -hmm. it is, yeah. um, that makes sense. Everyone came out of the pandemic feeling uh, like something changed. Something changed yeah. for all of us. Yeah. Uh, it was a good thing because more people realized that, you know, everyone can struggle with things and we became more, yeah. um, you know, understanding of each yeah. other. Uh, but also I think more people realize that work is not everything. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think it is more difficult now to do user groups and mm. in-person events than it was pre-pandemic but sure again i think as long as you find that core group of people just mm. you know hold on to them i love the fact that you've done it intentionally on the weekday i have to say because i was i've been surprised the number of events that actually take place over the weekend because i i fully agree it's 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 a work event um yes we can it's easy for to say yes you've said yourself it's also part of your hobby but it is primarily work stuff you're going to use this stuff in a professional environment yes i create stuff on my own time but the point is to, to do this and improve processes, all the stuff at work. So when I see events on the weekend, it's not like I'm like, oh, that irritates me. It doesn't. I've just been surprised the number that don't fall during the week. So I think it's really cool that you've done that. It's a very important message to, to put across. Nice. Yeah, I hope so. And also just going back to something you said before about things changing after the pandemic um, <laughs> and people thinking differently about things. I think for me, the one thing that changed for me most dramatically was um, really realizing that I couldn't take literally everything. I um, I always spent most of my life thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm the sort of person I'll never need to like speak to anyone about anything and a professional about sort of thing. And after the pandemic, I was like, I was like, if I don't speak to someone, it's going to get really bad. Yeah. And it was really actually in liberating in a really strange way to recognize limits oh i bet yeah i always just like and i don't know why it was a stupid thing to and when i remember what a really this thing that that was said to me was like you might think you can take a lot and it, that might be true but a lot doesn't you know if you take this thing and then you take another thing and then you take another thing a lot doesn't mean everything that's going to happen to you in the world and i never considered that so that was like it was huge and i really yeah. so although it was a, a negative part of my life, if you will, obviously the pandemic was a negative part of everyone's life and reaching that point where I needed to feel to speak to someone, what came out of it was so positive to actually kind of realize there's a different way of understanding, like, you know, how you deal with the things around you. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. I, I think a lot of people feel the same way, um, mm. but they might not feel comfortable saying it out loud. Mm, fair enough. Kind of, yeah. But yeah. I just got unintentionally deep there. <laughs> oh, it's good. I like that. I like good. That. That's good to hear. So anyway, on that note, it's been, oh my, it's an hour and five minutes. Yes. Sorry. Love I'm it. chatty. <laughs> well, yeah, me too. But this is what we, this is what we're here for, right? Yeah. To chat. To um, thank you very much for, for joining and taking your time out to, to come and have a conversation about all these things. It was. Yeah. Thank you for inviting very, me. Of course. It was, it was very enjoyable. And um, all the people in the chat with the amazing questions, thank you so much. By the way, this thing I'm holding on my hand, if you notice, it's just something that my son made for me. And I'm just, I always have to fiddle with something. And this, yeah. I right. have stuff as well. Yeah. 
the most I had to I I had to replace it because one of the things that I have in my desk is like this like pen knife thing, right? And I got into a habit of like opening the blade and playing with that. And I once <laughs> I once cut myself quite badly, and I was like, Ben, oh, of no. course, of course, that was going to happen. You're playing it with a knife, you fool. So I've always now something a bit softer, you know. It'd be probably a good idea. Like, just yeah. imagine you sitting in a meeting or a training, just like a knife, going like, okay. I know that's the thing it's as well. Now. Someone saw it once and was like, "What are you?" Yeah, I was like, "Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm putting it down. Don't worry." <laughs> Stick with the soft things. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, but it's, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, to all the people in chat as well, great comments. I've been reading all of it, even though I haven't replied to everything. But I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much, everyone. Catherine, thank you so much, and take care, and yeah, have fun. Ciao. Bye. Don't you wanna have